moral schizophrenia. In our society, it's okay to kill a baby right before birth, but it's murder to kill one after birth. That's what happens when moral choices are set by the will of the majority. Confusion reigns, and the price tag is devastating. We can keep eating the bitter fruit of rebelling against God, or we can turn to Him in faith and adopt His standards for behavior. Stay with us. From Chicago's Moody Church, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Today, in his series on Why the Cross Can Do What Politics Can't, Erwin Lutzer is teaching about the cross as the basis for morality, a basis sorely needed in a decaying culture. You know, that's the way it is with sin. You block this door and it comes through here. During the days of prohibition, they said, you know, no, uh, no whiskey. Well, uh, whiskey was bootlegged and people got it from here. And if they weren't able to get it from here, they stole it from there. It's a tough world out there. And when you're all finished, you wonder whether or not it was worth the effort, because unless you keep up some kind of a campaign all the time, your gains, first of all, are minimal. They don't last long, and they never really change the human heart. Now, what I need to tell you today, that if we want to put fire back into the train, if we want to restoke that old locomotive, we have to buy into some biblical propositions, and let me give them to you today. The first is this, that morality is based on God. It's based on God. You can't have morality without God. It's like asking for uh, leaves without a tree. It's like asking for petals without a flower. It just does not exist. Now, this would take one separate message. I could probably do it in 45 minutes in a lecture, but that's not what you're getting today. To prove that out of atheism, no morality whatever can arise, none. Now, the minute I say that, you say, oh, I know an atheist who's trustworthy. We even give him our keys when we go on vacation. Yes, of course, because atheists too are created in the image of God and therefore they have a sense of rightness and wrongness. Augustine referred to them as well as, uh, as those who were uh, virtuous pagans, he said. And there are such. But their morality arises out of the fact that they are creatures created in the image of God. It does not arise out of atheism. Logically, out of atheism, no morality, whatever can arise. Morality is tied to God. When God said, these are the Ten Commandments, He meant, this is what I am like. You look at those commandments and you get a glimpse of Me. Remember the liberals who thought that they could do away with the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and still keep the Sermon on the Mount? Boy, I'll tell you, that didn't last long. Because once they got rid of a supernatural Jesus and once they got rid of a transcendent God, they were left with the Sermon on the Mount that nobody wanted to obey. And so it was constantly rewritten to fit the fallenness of human nature. Because you cannot have morality without God. Secondly, morality ultimately is changed through the transforming work of Jesus Christ. The transforming work of Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. It is the transforming work, and that is the unique message of the church that you can't find in any of the political parties. And that's not wrong. I'm just simply stating a fact. That there is a transformation of heart that God wants to bring about. And then there's a third supposition that I want to give you today that is the most uh, direct to us today, and that is to say that we clean up the world best. We clean up the world best by cleaning up the church first. By cleaning up the church first. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. A culture much like ours. We've been to Corinth, some of us, and we remember the temple up on the hill, which was dedicated in those days to a thousand prostitutes. Homosexuality rampant. As a matter of fact, as Paul sat down to write this, Nero was about to marry a boy by the name of Scorpius. And it is said that 14 out of the first 15 Roman emperors were either homosexual or bisexual. 
So you have uh, all kinds of permissiveness. You have adultery, you have fornication, you have everything that you could possibly think about sexually and other kinds of sins in this pagan Corinthian culture. And Paul is writing a letter to the church. And he says in chapter 5, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife, very probably a stepmother. Uh, his mother probably died, his father remarried, and so the son and the stepmother are involved sexually. And Paul says, you know, things are bad in Corinth, but you don't even hear of that. I mean, there even the pagans draw some kind of a line in the sand. Now, this is a good time for us to pause for just a moment and to realize why it is that we should be so careful when we point our fingers at the world. And the reason that we should never come off as self-righteous as as pharisaical as on a pedestal pointing our fingers to all of the people in the world who disobey God's laws is, one of the reasons is because the very same sins frequently exist among us. That's why Paul is writing this. He's saying, this should have humbled you. And yet you've become proud and you've ignored it. Look at the sins that destroy society, whether it is abortion or divorce or homosexuality or alcoholism or drugs, you name it, it is within the church. It happens among us. And, and what Paul is saying is that those are the kinds of things that must be taken care of. Now, it's not wrong to say that this was in people's past. In fact, as we shall see in a moment, that's going to be Paul's emphasis is that people are converted out of all kinds of different sins. And that is understandable, and that's why a church body such as ours or any other church in America is a collection of people who have been saved out of some very, very damnable sins and iniquities. And that's the way it should be. But I'm talking about people who claim to be believers, people who say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus, and they continue in their former lifestyle. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested, he says, in 